<laughs> Are you John? Good. How are you? Get a little closer. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, so morning. Today, good morning. So today uh we're gonna spend some time talking about chat GPT specifically uh as our large language model and prompt engineering within chat GPT. So Let's go ahead. I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then uh, I have some exercises for us to kind of work on together. Because I think that, you know, practicing is the best way to learn how to do something. So if you are online uh, and you want to copy these slides, then I'll leave this up for just a minute so that you can do so. In addition to people in the room, you can scan the QR code. Yeah. Move the oh. because it'll do blocking. Some things do, some things don't. Okay. The, um, oh, this yeah, is yeah. That link. Yes. Can you put that link into the calendar invite for today? Yeah, I'll That's a good idea, actually. That is a good idea. So if you're just joining us, then go ahead and Scan the QR code or put in the URL so that you have these slides for later. Okay, I'm going to keep going, um, but if you need the slides, then I think John is in there also, so you can always put the link back in again. And it is in the calendar invite now. Perfect. And it's also in the calendar invite. Thanks. Except it's mistyped and new. <laughs> but it will be correct in just a second. All right, so what we're going to do is kind of talk generally about prompt engineering. I'm sure many of you have heard this phrase because it's become kind of like a buzzword over the last several, well, probably year. Um, or so. So we're going to talk about what prompt engineering is, and then we'll get into some specifics that will hopefully help you engineer your prompts in really effective ways. So when we use the phrase prompt engineering, this is just the phrase that we use to um, talk about what we put into a large language model of your choice um, and how what that um, what that does basically is it structures or tells the generative AI tool how it should best respond to you. So usually like the general rule of thumb is the more specific your prompt, the more high quality your output is going to be. The more vague your prompt, the more vague your output is going to be. And if anybody here has messed around with large language models so far, you know that um, chat GPT especially can be vague, right? Like it can like kind of ramble and talk very like generally about things. So that's why knowing how to do this is so important. Okay, um, and then this is just basically like a plug for why engineering your prompts is, is um, a good thing. So basically like the more confident you get with prompt engi engineering, the faster you're going to be using the large language model, the more accurate the response uh, is going to be that you get. And you're also going to be able to kind of like customize or tailor what sort of responses you want from chat GPT or Claude or whatever. Um, you know, to help you with whatever sort of specific things that you are working on. So it is something that like, once you know how to do this, the structure is really easy to follow and then you can kind of apply it to a whole bunch of different situations that you might be using. I will say now, and this is something that we've said a couple of times, but I think it's important to reiterate that like, even with the prompt engineering, you wanna be careful about what kind of information you are inputting, right? So do keep in mind to not put in anything overly personal, to not put in anything that could be considered private or sensitive information. So like personnel information, information like about specific um, like students, you know, like you wanna still try to keep your stuff relatively vague so that you don't um, get money with privacy or ethical considerations. That's really important. 
but there are still like ways to do this, right? Where then you can go back through and kind of add whatever you might need to add. You can still get a really good template here, which is what I think is so helpful about this. Uh, okay, so we're going to do a couple of these activities a little bit later on, but I wanted to just kind of give you examples, and I know that we've got people from all different parts of the university here, so we're thinking about how you can use prompt engineering to help you create content for your courses, whether it's just starting from scratch or, you know, like adding new exercises, new materials, things like that. Uh, how you can use large language models to support students, whether they're in your classes or outside of your class. So if you're in like a student support role, then you can use these strategies in that way. Uh, with research assistance that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Uh, that you can help, you know, draft documents for work on committees or, you know, like documents within your department and then kind of help you manage your everyday tasks. And I just threw email in here as an example. I know there are many others, but I know that one thing that we all have in common, regardless of where we work, um, is that we all have to deal with email. So um, that's usually a pretty big one. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is take you through some of the strategies that you can use to help yourself create effective prompts. So um, the thing that I want to kind of stress is that I'm going to give you six different uh components that you can consider using for prompt engineering not all of them are required but some definitely are okay so i'll be sure to tell you which ones you need and which ones you like don't always need um the thing that's important about this is that it is helpful to follow these steps in order um, i played around with this a lot last week because i had been using a different kind of strategy before that worked pretty well, um, but then when I started using this strategy, uh, I found the results to be even better. Um, so I do think that order matters, um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit uh, as we keep going. So the first thing that you're going to do, uh, and for people on Zoom and people in the room, I am going to give you a handout that has sort of like some of this information broken down. So um, don't worry about, you know, trying to keep up with me and take notes really, really quick. Um, you know, most of the stuff I'm going to give you will be on, on the handout too. So the first thing that you want to do is tell the large language model what its task is. So I found that starting with an action verb, and then I gave you a couple of examples, um, and clearly articulating your end goal is a really good way to begin. This is different from how I personally had been uh, engineering my prompts beforehand, but I found that when you tell it what you want it to do right from the beginning, that's helpful, right? It's almost like it's the first thing, you know, like how we talk about like, um, like skimming, you know, and how if you get a really, really long email, you read truly and earnestly, like the first maybe two or three sentences, and then you start to skim after that. I feel like it's almost a similar thing, right? Like the first thing is like the most important thing in a way. So by telling it the task, um, you know, and clearly saying what you want your end goal to be, that's a nice way to just kind of start narrowing down what you want. So um, there are a whole bunch of different action verbs. So um, one thing that, you know, you can do if you're not sure which action verb to use, you can ask chat GPT before you get started to give you a list. Um, and if you don't like give it any parameters, it will give you like 50 different verbs because I was messing around with that last week um, and got a whole bunch of action verbs for a whole bunch of action things. So um, choose a verb uh, and then say what you want your end goal to be. So for this example, I've got draft an email inviting students to participate in a volunteer event. So I've got my, uh, my action verb, and then I'm saying what I want my end goal to be, right? It's an email, but it's also, I gave like the purpose as well. So that's how you can get started. Yeah. Do you have that, John? Wait, what that is in the chat, ask if we can share the, um, the link to the slideshow, or I could go back. Oh, I can get it, yeah. Okay. John's gonna put it in the chat for you then. It's also in the calendar invite. Okay, after you say what your task is, then you're going to want to include some context or some background information. This is important because without this piece of information, the large language model is going to kind of like just 
pull at everything. There are so many possibilities, right? There are so many options. And that's one of the things that I think doesn't confuse the large language model, but it certainly like it, it encourages that vagueness. So you want to give some general context um, to chat GPT or whatever you're using to kind of help narrow things down to help focus it a little bit. So here's my example. So we know that we want to draft an email inviting students to um, a volunteer event. So I'm saying SUNY Oswego is organizing the event in collaboration with the city of Oswego. The event aims to plant trees in Brightback Park to promote environmental sustainability. So that is some background information, right? I'm saying a little bit about what I'm doing, right? Um, to give some more context to the LLM. Okay, this next step is not a requirement for like every time you do this, right? So this would be optional um, depending on whether or not you feel this would be helpful. For this particular example, I don't know if it would really help all that much, but I threw it in here just so that you would see an example of an example. So um, if you want the LLM to, per, um, to like follow a specific framework, um, then you can give it an example so that it can kind of model the same kind of general form. It would also model things like tone, uh, structure, like if you give it something and you want it to like also do bullet points, then it would follow that. So like, let's say like this one I think is helpful for email specifically. Like, let's say that you have like an email template that you like to generally follow, right? And you kind of use that and then fill it in for different contexts. I think that this is helpful if you want to kind of follow that same structure. And then this will kind of put it in for you in that same format. So if there is an example, um, or like if you're doing this like for teaching, right? And you want to create something that follows like the tilt framework, right? You can give it the name of a specific thing that it can then reference and kind of follow for you. So like I said, this is not a requirement for every prompt. And like in this one, especially, you know, um, ChatGPT already understands what an email is, right? And like kind of the general conventions of an email. So it might not need an example for this, but if you have like a particular format that you'd like to follow, then it can be really helpful in that regard. So um, what I said here is please model this email, right, the one that you're going to write, after the example I'm going to paste into the next message. So that can be really helpful, right? Um, you're telling ChatGPT to like wait to structure the email until you give it the example or until you give it the model. And that can be a helpful thing to do. All right, this one is helpful. Um, I think this one is really helpful to include. So the next part is, you know, who do you want chat GPT to become for this exercise? So do you want it to act as a professor? Do you want it to act as an academic advisor? Do you want it to be some kind of specialist? Last week, when we were doing the AI for personal productivity, um, Allison was here, right? And we told it to act like a person who's busy during the week and who doesn't like cooking dinner, right? So like, who do you want it to be? That's really important so that um, it can give you the general output that you are looking for. So like, for example, as I was starting to brainstorm for this presentation, I told ChatGPT to act as a generative AI expert, right? So that it could help me plan the presentation from that point of view. If I told ChatGPT to act as a generative AI, like novice, right, or beginner, then it probably would have given me a much different output. So this can be really, really helpful. You can put um, like famous people in here or like well-known fictional characters as well, if you're maybe looking to get an output that um, like maybe for a specific purpose or like if it's a class exercise or something like that. Like I've had ChatGPT act as Bob Ross many times, you know? So the only thing you wanna make sure is that the famous person or fictional character that you are using is well-known enough for the large language model to recognize it, otherwise it might just start hallucinating. 
So, and then what we've got the example here is, um, so for the purposes, I'm just gonna move this for one second. So for the purposes of the email that we're working on, right? I told um, Chad GPT to act as an academic planning coordinator for the educational, uh, educational opportunity program. So I asked it to act as though it were an advisor for EOP. Okay. So the next piece <clears throat> is the format. This I think is really helpful. This is one of my favorite parts of prompt engineering is telling it what you want the output to look like. So do you want something that's written in paragraphs? Do you want something that's structured like an email? Do you want a table with a specific number of rows and columns? If you do that, you can also tell it how to label the rows and columns, right? You can say how you want things broken up. Do you want a list? Do you want an outline or do you want something else, right? There are a whole bunch of possibilities to think about when you consider format. Um, that's why the example one that we did earlier is sort of sometimes hit or miss, right? Because I feel like this format one is kind of doing the same thing. Um, but, you know, again, the example can be helpful if you want it to follow something like really, really closely. Um, it's also a great opportunity to create a rubric, for example, asking yeah. for the table. Absolutely. Yep, yeah, so rubrics, like John said, um, really, really helpful here. And so here is me telling it the format that I want. This is helpful, I think, because, because Chad, DPT, and I have different ways that we understand the word short, right? To me, short is like 50 to 100 words. The chat GPT short is like 600 words, right? So like it's, and I think it's important, you know, like you are thinking about like a word count to try to be specific in that regard instead of just telling it, you know, like if you say like write an essay, you know, it will go on and on and on, but you want to give it some more parameters to follow. And then the last one, this one I think is helpful. Um, it's not always re like required, I would say, but um, I find this one to be helpful just as, um, especially if you're, if you're writing something that someone else is going to read, right? Like I think that this really adds to the whole purpose and audience piece. Um, so, you know, how do you want the, um, you know, what's, what, yeah, what's created to sound, you know? Do you want it to be more formal? Do you want it to be casual? Do you want it to be fun? Do you want it to be sarcastic? Do you want it to be bored? Do you want it to be enthusiastic? Whatever, right? Um, so I think you can also, right, if you're not sure, you can tell ChatGPT just like we did with the action, uh, with the action verbs. You can say like, okay, like here's the feeling that I'm going for. You know, like I want people to like be you know, like feel comfortable with me, but I don't want to be like too over the top, you know, like whatever. Um, so you can ask ChatGPT to generate some like keywords for you, and then you can choose from those keywords because again, there are so many feelings that we could be feeling. Um, it can be kind of overwhelming, right? Um, to get started. So here's my example. In the email, use clear and concise language, but write in a friendly and approachable tone. Because the email that I'm working on drafting is coming from me, right? Um, or the person I'm pretending to be, rather. And it's going out to a whole bunch of students, right? And it's about an, an opportunity to help clean up the environment. So that's why uh, I want it to sound this way. Okay. So let's look then between like at a difference between a prompt that is very, very basic and then a prompt that is engineered through using the steps that we just talked about. So basic prompt, help me create a cleaning schedule for my home. I tried to choose something that would affect many of us. <laughs> um, so if we look at this, I'm gonna get out of here for a minute. I'm gonna come over here. Okay, you can go up there. All right, so here's me putting in the prompt, help me create a cleaning schedule for my home. And then this is what chat GPT did. So it gives me a template to help me get started. It gives me daily tasks. 
Then it gives me weekly tasks and it breaks them down by day, which I think is interesting, right? That's still a lot. Like for like a Monday, like for me to dust my whole house, that's a lot. Um, so here's by day, right? And it does it Monday through Friday for me. And then it gives me tasks that I should do every month. So I should deep clean the kitchen. Yeah, right. Um, baseboards, the same thing. And then it also gave me some quarterly or biannual tasks. And then everything that I should do over the course of a year. So this is like good, right? It's fine. It's got like a whole bunch of detail. I liked that it broke it up by day and by week and then by month and then like bigger things, right? I thought that that was pretty helpful. But then um, let's think about what a, like a better prompt could be, right? And we're gonna follow the framework that we just talked about. So I'm starting with my action verb, right? Create a cleaning schedule for my home. And now I'm going to give it some background information. The schedule should be accomplished within one month and should include daily and deep cleaning chores. Thank you. So um, I gave it some more parameters because like, I felt like with the first output that having stuff like, like the day, the week, the month, and then like a couple times a year, like that was like a lot for me, okay? Like I'm just looking for something like that I can do within one month, let's say, something that I'm just, I'm just gonna get started. So um, I did give it an example, right? So I skipped to the next part, which was what I wanted to act as. So act as an experienced professional uh, with their own cleaning business, format this schedule into a table with three headers, daily cleaning tasks, weekly cleaning tasks, and deep cleaning tasks. So that's how I want it to look. And then I'm giving it kind of like some extra parameters, like include any helpful tips or tricks to clean difficult or grimy areas like the oven, for example, which I absolutely hate to clean. So this is, um, you know, the same prompt, but engineered a little bit differently. So let's look and see what chat GPT did. Okay, look at this beautiful table. So I've got, and some of the some of the content is the same, right? Which makes sense because I didn't ask it to give me, you know, like specific area and you could have, right? Like let's say you want um, you know, like just to focus on a bedroom, just to focus on a full bathroom, right? Just to focus on a basement. So you can think about that also, right? But I'm still looking at kind of like the whole home. So it broke it down for me and it did the three uh, columns on the table like I asked it to. Um, and I've got the deep cleaning tasks too, which is great. And then here are my helpful tips and tricks. The thing I like about this table too is that this is much more manageable, right? Like I can print this out and it's gonna be on one piece of paper. I could put it on my refrigerator, right? Or like, you know, whatever. Uh, so that I can, it's, it's more compact, which for me personally, like I like for something like this. But if you, you know, if you want something more um, expansive, then you can ask it for that. And then for helpful tips and tricks, it gave me info on how I could clean my oven what I could do with my bathroom tile. I also like that a lot of the stuff, and I didn't ask for this, right? But I think this is really interesting. It's giving me like more natural solutions to uh, cleaning, right? It's not telling me to go buy Lysol or go buy Clorox, right? A lot of the times I've got baking soda and water. Um, there's vinegar, you know, hydrogen peroxide, whatever. Um, I feel like, that, like this made me laugh. Like when I first read it, Start by removing all the items in the shelves from your refrigerator before you clean it, right? So I mean, that's helpful. Um, and then it's got, you know, at the end, it gives me a little blurb that says you can maintain a clean and welcoming home environment efficiently, efficiently within every oh, I got it. <laughs> so um, it just goes to show like the difference, right? As you go about engineering your prompts and what that can do. And it's really not, you know, like, yes, it's a paragraph, but, um, you know, it didn't take a very long time for me to generate this, right, which I think is, is worth mentioning also. And I could have sat down and, like, made the table myself and whatever, but 
I really didn't want to, you know, this was fast. Okay, so um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break from listening to me talk because I feel like we need to. And here's a handy handout. So people on Zoom, I'm giving everybody in the room a handy handout, but you can use the link that's right there. It should take you to a Google Doc. And this handy handout is two-sided. So one of the sides has an overview of all of the different pieces of the prompt engineering that we just went through. Um, because I know it's annoying sometimes to click back through a whole bunch of slides. So I put them all here for you. And then on the other side of the handout, there are some exercises. So depending on what sort of work you find yourself doing, right, on a regular basis. So for some people, you know, like you might be able to choose from all four of these, right? Um, for others, you might be more interested in one exercise over another. What we've got are four different choices. So I want you to work on one of these for a little bit of time. And then I want you to follow the framework that's on the other side of this handout or for people on Zoom's the first page of this handout. So let's say, right, like for fun, you want to do like number four, right? Let's say, um, so your job, your objective is to create an email template to share a new policy. So these were kept vague on purpose because I want you to work on making them more specific using the strategies that you've got on this other side of the handout, right? And everybody's purpose is going to be a little bit different. So um, let's say for number four, you have to make an email template to share your policy, create a prompt to communicate important information. You determine what that important information is, right? You can have fun with this. It's just to, you know, um, just to kind of play around with this a little bit. So make prompts to communicate important information. So maybe the new policy is that like on Friday, nobody wears shoes to work, right? I don't know. But like, you, it doesn't need to be super serious. Like it can be serious, but you can have fun with it. So um, maybe on Fridays, nobody wears shoes to work. Um, and the reason for that is, that's a terrible example. Everybody eats donuts on Fridays instead, right? And the reason is we're getting ready for a super fun weekend, right? And donuts are delicious. So you wanna create an email um, that is going to share this information with an audience of your choice. Um, and then if you want, this is optional, right? You can give it an example of like a previous email, right? And you could put that in to chat GPT and say, follow this format, right? And I want your tone to sound like this. Um, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Again, make sure that whatever you put in, especially if you are giving examples, doesn't have any sensitive or like really personal information, okay? It can say things like the name of the school, the name of the department, that's okay, right? But try not to get into too many specific details beyond that. So what I want everybody to do is choose one of these and follow the prompt engineering strategies that are on the opposite side. And then we're gonna come together and hopefully um, share some of the examples of the output that you got. Does anybody in the room have any questions? Including the virtual room. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go there next. Oh. Yeah, uh, Sarah. Okay, I just have a question that you probably covered in a different session about signing in to chat GT. Yeah. That chat GPT as opposed to being anonymous. Yep. So you absolutely for this, the nice thing is that like you don't need an account for chat GPT anymore. So if you don't want to sign in, then you can just go to chat GPT's website and still do this without having an account. But if you want to sign in, then you can. And it's just chatgpt.com. Yep. Yep. So if you're going to use um, another large language model like Claude, that one you need to create an account to use all of the time, right? But chat GPT can change it from now you go when you need one. Okay. That's a good question. Um, does anybody on Zoom have any questions before I stop talking for a minute? Quiet. Okay. So let's uh, let's take a couple of minutes uh, to mess around with this, and then we'll come back together.
right? The typing is slowing down in the room. So if you're on Zoom, take about one more minute to finish up and then we can come back together. I don't think they need to employ us anymore. This is a good email. Well, it can make us more productive so we don't have, we can go back to a time when we didn't have to spend as much time on email, maybe. Unless it generates more email. <laughs> John, if people online have things, will that bar pop back up up here or no? They can. Um, uh, escape will bring it back. Okay. But I'll, I'll monitor it. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So um, there are a couple of people in the room, and one of them mentioned that she's really excited to share what she came up with. So I'm going to call on her first, and then uh, we'll switch to Zoom, and then we'll maybe go to the other person in the room. Uh, Allison, what did you do? Okay. I did the student support exercise, and I said, ask a successful professional in their mid 30s who is great at getting work done, but also having time to relax and have fun. Create a list of bullet points to help college students or parents with busy lives understand the benefits of using a calendar or planning system. Use clear and concise language, but write in a friendly and approachable tone. Use some current slang. Oh, <laughs> it gave me a list of 10 things. Uh, the first one says, keep to organize AF. No more forgetting deadlines or important events. A calendar or planning system helps you stay on top of your game, whether it's submitting assignments or attending that lit party next weekend. I'll scroll down to number 10. Empowers you to own your own time. Instead of letting life happen to you, take control of your schedule like a boss. With a planner, you're the master of your own destiny and your own Netflix binge sections. Interesting. Okay. Did it have, you know, like slang kind of scattered throughout all of the instructions? Yes. Adulting like a pro. Um, you can crush it in class and still have time for self-care. It's like having a personal cheerleader reminding you to play those goals. That's interesting. Yeah. Some of them are cringy, or cringy, but some of them are, are cute, you know? Um, I don't know, the one about like crushing it and then something else, I can't remember. Slaying is still yeah somewhat, yeah some of those date back a few years because of the training database that it uses. Yeah. So its definition of current may be different than students, but. It would be interesting to put in like like slang from 2024 and see if that changes it. Yeah, does the free version have data on that? I'm not sure. I don't know. We have to see. Yeah. Um, the paid version could do that because it does yeah. a search. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Allison, do you feel like what what are your like general thoughts about doing this? I thought it was great. It came up with a list way faster than I would have, but it had some of the same things that I, same points that I would have made. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Make some posters of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like thoughts. Um, does anybody on Zoom want to share what you came up with? And you can share the screen if you'd like, or just state it. Um, I asked, uh, a, I was actually at, using Claude and, um, I asked it to um, explain the changes to our grade appeal policy. The faculty assembly passed in the spring. You know, I asked it to do it in paragraphs and I asked it to use the tone of professor to professor. Okay. And I asked it to offer a little rationale about why this appeal is an improvement over the current policy. Um, overall, and I said, you know, I want to, you know, casual yet professional as if one faculty is speaking to another faculty. So the, the salutation is, hey folks, <laughs> is nothing I've ever used to talk to other faculty, but all right, <laughs> you know, easy enough to change. But actually, the body of it was um, um, particularly good. It just gave the highlight: if a student appeals a grade and the de dean determines the review is warranted, they now have the option to appoint a committee of three tenured faculty members to take a closer look at the case. And it describes faculty members are chosen, 
And then I asked, you know, I asked it to provide rationale of why it's an improvement because it brings a diverse set of perspectives and ensures the appeal process is thorough and fair. It's an extra layer of oversight and helps maintain the integrity of our overall grading system. So. One other thing I would note about Claude is that you it will take in hundreds of pages of text. So you could give it a sample of your own writing on similar issues and then ask it to use your tone and it will sound almost identical to the way in which you would have written. That's great, Liz. I, I do find that sometimes the, you know, like the friendliness feels a little bit forced with the LLM or, you know, with the models, but, um, you know, a lot of the body stuff tends to work out okay. Um, and one other thing that I'll mention kind of just connected to Liz's example is if you are asking chat DGT or Claude to revise something for you, right? You could put in your original and then ask it to make revisions based off of your original, but then to like to bold the changes that it makes so that you can easily see the differences between your original and like the new one. You know, if you are asking for just like a few small changes, you know, um, then that's one nice way to easily see what you will put in and then, you know, like what the differences are now that um, ChatGPT has made some changes. So just kind of like a plug or something to mention, you know, um, about revision, especially. Thank you, Liz. Um, Sarah, would you like to share yours? Sure. Or, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just am struck by, all right, so I'll give that example. So I said, um, write a brief email that invites participants to join the new advisory committee for an academic library. The committee will consist of faculty, staff, and students. The purpose of the committee will be to advise library administration and librarians on existing library services and potential new library services and resources. Act as the library administrator, write this in an official but approachable form. And the result is fantastic. Oh, I don't even know if I have to change anything. That's amazing. But that's it, really is kind of um, disturbing to me. What like it's it's creepy. It's very very good because it goes it talks it it has like it's a it has like fun reopening. I'm not gonna read it out loud because I don't want it to go on record when you all see it later. Um no, but it's great because it it, it has the it has a um, description of the purpose of the committee. Primary objectives of the committee include and then has three bullet points. And it says a meeting should be held and then it adds the frequency of meetings. Members will have the opportunity to engage in meaningful discussion, share perspectives, and contribute ideas to further enrich their public services. Your expertise and insight will be invaluable. Blah, 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 blah. If you're interested in either becoming a member or have any questions, feel free to contact me directly. Thank you for your consideration. I look forward to the opportunity to work together to enhance our library services to benefit them all. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. It is something similar to what I might have what I would have written. So that's why I find it's a little bit alarming. It's like it's in my head. <laughs> so wow, good job, Chad GP. I'm very impressed. It is crazy. And I mean, I think you know, in a lot. It, yeah, it, it is. Like, you have to kind of sit with it for a little bit, I think. Um, but it can really, you know, I mean, I wonder how much time, you know, like, I know, like, if I'm thinking of a new idea or a new initiative or whatever, you know, I'm sitting down and I'm writing ideas about it and I'm thinking and thinking and thinking for a long time, you know, and it's good to think, obviously, right, like, for all the higher education. But um, sometimes even just having a template you know, or having like some ideas to follow can be really helpful. But um, the fact that it cranked out something that you really like um, must, you know, Sarah's face is like, is, is great right now. Yeah, it's, it's the, <laughs> the like, I'm alarmed face. Yes. Um, I think we have time for just maybe one more. Is there anybody else on Zoom who would like to talk about which one you chose and what the output was like? I, mine was very basic, so I don't think it's going to shed any light. I use a very basic um, format, so but it came it came back with something very usable. It was a simple policy, so nothing really useful to add. Okay, thank you, Lisa. 
I can share mine very briefly. Um, I asked it, so I was coming at it from a librarian perspective, um, asked it to generate a list of library search terms for researching the impact of generative AI on college writing skills, college student writing skills. Acting as a freshman researcher with beginning level research skills and to please put the search terms into a bulleted list. Um, I added the freshman researcher was because I was just curious what it thought a freshman researcher would would uh, generate. So the the list that it came back with was actually really good. Um, it definitely wasn't freshman level, but it was really good search terms. Um, and then I then asked it to find articles related using one of those search terms. And I was happy that it said, I can't directly access databases or the internet. So basically you should go to the library, um, but here's how to do that at the library. And it was pretty spot on in terms of what it told the students, the steps it gives like numbered steps of what to do with those search terms using the library databases. So it was a pretty decent response. That's thanks, Deb. I, I do really like that about the free version of Chat GPT is that like it will say I well you, unless it makes something up, right? But like it will say I you know I can't help you with that, but you should go to your library. You should go you know like ask someone um, at your institution for help. Um, and I have found too, like you said, that the suggestions that it gives you about next steps, I've usually found to be to be okay, you know, so I do like that. Um, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Did you find, Deb, that the the keywords were still pretty advanced for a freshman or were they not advanced enough? They were pretty advanced. I mean, it came back with like algorithmic writing assistance and uh, mm -hmm. influence of AI on student writing proficiency. So some of them were good, but definitely not freshman level, I would say, but um, a freshman who's learning potentially. <laughs> yeah, it'd be yeah. interesting too to to tweak it more and see what the difference is. And ch so change like freshman in college to maybe freshman in high school and see if it makes a big difference or if it's still like pretty advanced in that way. Mm -hmm. Be an interesting experiment. Thank you. Um, all right, we have just about two minutes left. So um, does anybody online have any questions or any comments about? Uh, prompt engineering or anything that you would like to see in the future that's related to prompt engineering that uh, John and or myself could pull together. Um, Stephanie, I would just, if, if someone were to adapt your handout for use in a class in the fall and a student activity, how would you like that to be cited or are you comfortable with that at all? You can absolutely do that and then just put um, the name of the breakout at the bottom and uh, that's probably it. That's probably good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. Does anybody have any final comments or questions? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, happy Monday, and I'll see you, uh, see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. We'll stop the session, stop the recording, and then stop the session, and then we'll be right back.